June 16th, 2015, Donald Trump descended an escalator into the gilded lobby of Trump Tower in downtown Manhattan to officially announce his candidacy for the president of the United States. That is some group of people, thousands. The idea that Trump could actually win the U.S. presidential election didn't occur to many people at the time, certainly not to American liberals, who viewed his campaign as an irrelevant publicity stunt and a way to score some easy laughs. Donald Trump, just last week, he confirmed to the National Review that he is again considering a run in 2016. Do it. <laughs> do, do it. Look, look at me. Do it. As the months dragged on, this laughter became tinged by a growing sense of unease as Trump steadily rose to the head of the Republican pack. Donald Trump is America's back mole. It, it may have seemed harmless a year ago, but now that it's gotten frighteningly bigger, it is no longer wise to ignore it. Yet even as he ascended the stage of the Republican National Convention to accept his party's nomination in July of 2016, many people still refused to believe what was happening right before their eyes. We're back with David Hundo P. Pluff, the man who says Hillary Clinton has a 100% chance of winning. I continue to believe Mr. Trump will not be president. So you think this presidential race is just about up? Virtually over. The only thing that can save Donald Trump now, frankly, is some type of external intervention. This came to an abrupt end on election night as stunned pundits soberly announced that Donald J. Trump would be sworn in as the 45th president of the United States. You're awake, by the way. You're not having a terrible, terrible dream. Also, you're not dead and you haven't gone to hell. This is your life now. This is our election now. This is us. This is our country. It's real. Thank you. The Democratic Party and its various corporate media appendages had grossly underestimated the anti-establishment backlash that decades of neoliberal capitalist policies had fostered among broad swaths of the American population. Trump's campaign had effectively tapped this deep reservoir of seething anger and poured gasoline on the flames by appealing to the patriarchal and nationalist impulses of white America. Get the fuck out of here! On election night, as 4chan trolls and alt-right figures celebrated and liberals sank into paralysis and fatalistic despair, anarchists, anti-authoritarians, and crowds of angry youth took to the streets. In cities across the country, large, spontaneous demonstrations broke out before the votes were even finished being tallied. Many of these protests were militant, with participants burning effigies, clashing with police, and shutting down major highways. In Oakland, two police cars were smashed up and burned, and several cops were sent to the hospital with injuries. Within this charged political atmosphere, a multi-city network of anarchists stepped up to begin planning a massive demonstration aimed to coincide with Trump's inauguration on January 20th. Within days, a website was calling on people to hashtag disruptj20. Over the next 30 minutes, we will take a look at the historic protests that rocked the streets of DC that day as well as the unprecedented wave of mass repression that followed. Along the way, we will speak with a number of defendants and their supporters as they share their experiences of running riot in Washington, taking on the Department of Justice in court, and ultimately staying out of trouble. somebody that literally will take this country and make it great again. Donald Trump wins the presidency. The next day, we're just like, now what? Days later, we had a website up, put together a video, a Facebook event, and all this. Folks got us folks counsel together. It was probably one of the best mobilizations of coalitions that I've ever been a part of. The Spooks Councils were, according to the principles of consensus and according to also the St. Paul principles of organizing, it's a great way to organize a massive number of people according to basic anarchist principles. 
Our solidarity will be based on respect for a diversity of tactics and the plans of other groups. The actions and tactics used will be organized to maintain a separation of time or space. Any debates or criticisms will stay internal to the movement, avoiding any public or media denunciations of fellow activists and events. We oppose any state repression of dissent, including surveillance, infiltration, disruption, and violence. We agree not to assist law enforcement actions against activists and others. Different assemblies organized different aspects, and there was about nine different black tickets that were organized in those assemblies, as well as like, a permitted march, J19, which was kind of like a protest against Deplorable, as well as the anti-capitalist and anti-fascist march. So we were able to convene broader mass meetings that drew four to 600 people in some cases, break down into smaller working groups around the specific direct action blockades, the unpermitted march, the permitted festival of resistance, art, housing, medics, legal, like we had a whole array of things. No one wanted to just show up and just show out. Like, there was a definite message about disrupting the inauguration. Burning cars and smashed windows. Protesters dressed in black, their faces covered, armed with hammers and bricks. Bricks and rocks being thrown right here at the police. Six officers reportedly injured. <laughs> to shut down a checkpoint. We started with a rally in front of the MPD offices. Obviously, one of the things we continue to fight is the police brutality and murder here in DC. And the first thing we did was lock up in chains to what would have been the checkpoint entrances to the actual parade route. We got there before it opened. Nobody ever got through that checkpoint for the entire day. We certainly attended with an obvious attempt to disrupt the inauguration, specifically because of the rising fascism of Trump. So there was a little speech, and then we just started marching. In the beginning, it was just like any normal march, people chanting you know, down the street. And then slowly I noticed people pulling trash cans and you know, newspaper bins into the street. And then there was fireworks. And then finally, like I started seeing windows broken. I remember seeing the Bank of America, all their windows were completely gone. So this is what happens in the rest of the world when people fight against a fascist government. Levels of seriousness that are not like our protests here where we yell and scream and then go home. That people start realizing like, this is a little more serious than just I'm mad today or our president is gonna be terrible. Yeah, and looking back as a participant, that day cemented what solidarity looks like. But then all of a sudden, Everyone just started running. The cops would come and corner us one way, making us go another way, and then they'd corner us this way. So while we're running away, eventually we notice there's a whole bunch of cops in front of us. We were eventually kettled on a corner of 12th and L Street in downtown DC. The bravery and the spirit that people maintained during a very long period of being held outside on the corner. And so we were held from about 10 a.m. until well after nightfall, and people were very good about sharing food and sharing water and medical supplies and cigarettes or whatever else people needed to kind of keep their state of normal. And so the actual arrest was a very interesting time where people were sharing tactical advice and strategic advice. And then eventually we were just arrested one by one and spent the night in jail and were released the next evening. For years now, cops in D.C. have had a reputation for being relatively restrained when it comes to dealing with public protests. But while it's therefore understandable that the indiscriminate use of flashbangs, pepper spray, and mass arrest that occurred at the J-20 protests caught many participants by surprise, these actions weren't without historical precedent. Back in the heyday of the anti-globalization movement, Washington was ground zero for two major protests against the World Bank and IMF. 
where similarly heavy-handed crowd control tactics were employed by DC's Metropolitan Police Department, or MPD, as part of an official policy of preemptive mass arrest dubbed Trap and Detain. At the so-called A16 anti-capitalist demonstrations of April 2000, the MPD arrested over 1,300 people, including a sweeping roundup of 648 protesters on the eve of the weekend's major demonstration. Two years later, at a similar protest in September of 2002, the MPD and federal U.S. Parks Police encircled and mass arrested around 400 people in Pershing Park, one block away from the White House. Detainees were hogtied and left in stress positions for more than 24 hours before ultimately being released. Civil rights lawyers, led by the Partnership for Civil Justice, responded to these two mass arrests by suing the MPD and the federal government. The resulting lawsuits cost DC taxpayers over $20 million in damages, embarrassed city politicians and the police top brass, and ultimately led to legislation that placed new controls on police activity, including guidelines explicitly outlawing the use of arbitrary mass detention. But it's a well-known fact that police don't exactly appreciate checks on their authority, and the cops in DC are no exception. On the day of the Disrupt J20 protests, Interim Police Chief Peter Newsham, who 16 years earlier had personally ordered the mass arrest of protesters in Pershing Park, had been on the job for just over four months, and no doubt emboldened by Trump's campaign promises to give cops free reign to brutalize people however they saw fit, he decided that the era of playing nice was over. On January 21st, over 230 people had spent the night in lockup, but we didn't know what the charges were going to be. When we were first arrested, I assumed that it would just be a $50 fine. The day of our court date, I realized that we're actually all being charged with a felony. And I was like, whoa, this is big. There was a solid amount of people that were just frankly scared and for like good reason. Fuck your dreams. Fuck your aspirations. You know, you're gonna be in jail. That's another world you have to process and readjust yourself to. And we were not about to go there. So we were initially each charged with one count of felony riot. Three months later, while I was at an anarchist gathering in Mexico, I received an email from a comrade which informed me that the superseding indictment had been issued. And in that superseding indictment, we were given numerous additional charges. This includes felony riot, conspiracy to riot, several counts of destruction of property, inciting a riot, several counts of assault, and several counts of assault on an officer with a deadly weapon. It was insane, you know, facing 80 years in prison was very nerve-wracking. The idea is to charge people with far more crimes than you could possibly convict on. And though you realize that this is probably just a scare tactic to get people to accept pleas, you're still facing 80 years in prison. In Washington, D.C., prosecutors have filed a slew of additional felony and misdemeanor charges against more than 200 people who were arrested at protests during President Trump's inauguration January 20th. The new charges mean protesters are now facing up to 75 years in prison. After the mobilization, Washington, D.C. was fairly spent. So as we are kind of developing the legal collective and the legal framework, particularly MAC, the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council and Richmond folks kind of like stepped up. I became more involved in providing legal support uh, on January 21st, sort of directly in the aftermath. There were multiple different sort of hubs of people providing different kinds of support, and the place that I was most active was in the DC Legal Posse, the collective that, that sort of sprung up specifically to provide support. MAC helped bottom line the initial assemblies of defendants that allowed for folks to draw together four different points of unity to sign on to. People would break off, come up with ideas, and then we would discuss them. Be like, I don't like this point, but I do like this point. Let's expand a bit on this point. Everything was hinging on having to make this shit work. This was very much a multi-city, decentralized effort. Multi-city for us meant movement for black lives more locally, but in contacting the movement for black lives nationally, which is made up of about 75 
different national organizations and really coordinating with them to talk about what this meant and to make sure that when we talked about it that we always incorporated places like Ferguson where there are political prisoners from the Ferguson uprising. So the coordination essentially were weekly meetings and different calls that people did legal research and kind of like formed working groups. And those working groups did various tasks. I was able to help with a lot of the media work. You know, the defendants wanted to do their own media and like, that's the best kind of media there is anyway. I gave a bunch of interviews. We did a lot of off the record background for reporters to explain how this case fits into a larger context. So it was a very robust campaign. We had yard signs. It was very grassroots. It was very professional. So I was really proud of the work that everyone did. We use a lot of decentralized tactics to approach it. One of the things which is really quite amazing with the large and diverse group of people who faced federal prosecution was the ability for people to act collectively and to resist this kind of knee-jerk reaction to take some sort of plea bargain. Before J20, there had been folks charged with rioting at Standing Rock. I think that there was a charge in Minneapolis. There was a charge brought in the same day in New Orleans. I think that there were similar charges brought against activists in Sacramento. And so people were worried that this was going to be part of a wave. I would say that the charges are designed to uh, criminalize certain forms of dissent. They're designed certainly to criminalize tactics and strategies, specifically the use of public mass assemblies and specifically the use of black bloc tactics. The U.S. Justice Department actually tried to say that participating in a black bloc was a conspiracy or riot. Very early on, it became clear that the state had taken the 230 people and broken them up into categories. And it seemed to be that the categories were meant to show a continuum of culpability. There was movers, which were like allowed for reabsorption. There was alleged breakers, which were people who did an alleged act, such as break a window or throw a newspaper box into the street. The third category, which I was accused of, was an alleged organizer. People who allegedly made the black block on J20 happen. The fact that there had been these changes to police procedure and these limitations to police tactics that had been won after some pretty brutal clashes in the early 2000s had sort of established the tone in D.C. And I think a lot of people in D.C. had gotten used to the police handling people with kid gloves. And I think the police had gotten used to a lot of permitted marches. I've grown up here. I've lived here my whole life. We thought that there wouldn't be mass arrests on J20 because there hadn't been mass arrests since something like a decade prior. One of the reasons that it caught everyone off guard in D.C. is that the law that was used to, to prosecute people hadn't actually been used to prosecute anyone since the early 70s. And it was passed by Congress in the wake of the uprisings in Newark and Detroit, basically because they were afraid of the, of the prospect of black people rising up in D.C. There was a definite need to say why we support J20. You know, a lot of times folks were like, that's just the skinny white folks with masks on, and we don't have anything to do with that when the truth is, they are us and we are them. And so it could have been us on J20, but it's always us as black liberation fighters. The potential threat for becoming political prisoners or political casualties is high in this game, and we know that. Federal prosecutors in the United States have become quite fond of grossly overcharging defendants in hopes of scaring them into taking plea deals. It's a big reason why more than 90% of criminal offenses in the U.S. never make it to trial. This was the same tried and tested strategy that U.S. Assistant Prosecutor and Deputy Chief of D.C.'s Felony Major Crimes Division, Jennifer Kirkhoff, tried to use on the J-20 co-defendants by slapping a staggering list of felonies on nearly 200 individuals connected only by the dubious assertion that everyone arrested on the streets of DC that day was part of a conspiracy to riot. Kirchhoff no doubt expected those on the receiving end of these charges to freak out and start flipping on one another, thereby setting the stage for a series of easy convictions for lesser charges. Unfortunately for her, the J-20 defendants refused to roll over. Early on in their legal process, many of them signed on to a shared statement of principles in which they made it clear that they would refuse to cooperate with the state's efforts to prosecute them, and pledged to coordinate legal defense and support efforts. Faced with this firm resolve and collective solidarity, 
the U.S. Department of Justice had no choice but to try and make their outlandish case stick. In a desperate attempt to do just this, they subpoenaed California-based hosting provider DreamHost to try and force them to turn over the IP addresses of everyone who visited the website disruptj20.org. They also sought access to suspected organizers' personal Facebook accounts in an attempt to dig up dirt that might help prove the existence of a conspiracy. These efforts largely failed, and they were forced to rely heavily on evidence provided by discredited far-right news outlets. The ensuing trials were a massive humiliation for Kirchhoff and the entire American justice system. Conspiracies are essentially a thought crime. A conspiracy to riot is essentially three people getting together and saying there should be a riot. What conspiracy law basically says is that anyone who's convicted of or can be found liable for any particular crime, in this case the criminal conspiracy, is thus responsible for all the crimes that stem from that. Essentially saying if you were out on the streets on, you know, inauguration day and you were dressed a certain way, chanting the same chants, espousing certain messages, by bringing uh, medics, you are presumptively part of a plot hundreds of people deep to riot in the streets. The state asserted in a rather untraditional way that the conspiracy itself can be spontaneous. In other words, if two people are walking by uh, a store and they say, hey, that store looks unlocked, let's go rob it, that a conspiracy is actually derived in that moment. So the state argued that during the, the J-20 um, actions, that people conspired in the streets. It means that they have a much lower bar to clear in terms of what they need to prove. It gives prosecutors an incredible amount of leeway in terms of uh, who they can charge. The state would consistently assert that defendant A did not assault anyone, nor did they break any windows. But by being present at an assembly, they have thus conspired to facilitate others to break windows and to carry out assault. Hey there everyone, this is James O'Keefe with Project Veritas. Uh, after we release these few videos exposing Disrupt J20, we have a couple updates for you. Project Veritas is an organization that has made their mark sending these individuals into organizations and planning meetings who are pretending to just be another left-wing participant, just another lefty, but actually they're wired up with um, secret cameras and try to find things that they think they can use as dirt against the organization to try these organizations in the court of public opinion and either bring down their funding or bring down their support and give them a bad name. Our attorney met with the uh, terrorism task force detective this morning. The representative from the U.S. Attorney's Office was also uh, going to be attending and our attorney reports to us that uh, they are looking at the full footage they are investigating they're analyzing the tapes and the batches of emails we've sent them so they contacted us last night looks like there's been some legal developments the prosecution was convinced that this one video that they had of an open public meeting where the the anti-capitalist anti-fascist march was discussed um, was like a really uh, important part of their case I made an offhanded comment that became kind of like a center for why I got indicted. Okay, and just remember when we go to the Festival of Resistance, that's like a space that's supposed to be family friendly. So like, don't break a window at like the Festival of Resistance. You know, in hindsight, I made a dumb comment. Project Veritas was not actually the only sort of ultra right wing organization that the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Metropolitan Police Department collaborated with and used footage from um, in this prosecution. I think Alex Jones and various other far right wing outlets actually infiltrated the mass meeting. They also got um, independent footage and reports from uh, the Oath Keepers, which is a right wing militia from uh, Rebel Media, um, which is a, an alt right white nationalist um, media outlet from Canada. Hammers, holy crap. This is not peaceful protest, this is anarchy. At the end of the last of those video files, um, the Project Veritas operative is chatting with a few people, and they, you see at the end of the video, the initial one that we got, the operative in this 
guy he was talking to you kind of walk out of the doors of the building they're in and the video just stopped. Go back out there. A year plus later, after um, some litigation about, you know, very generally speaking, the completeness of the Project Veritas cash that um, the defense had been given, the government made a second disclosure of the four video files we got, plus some additional video files we had never been given access to. The fourth video file of, of that initial four that was disclosed, when we get to the end scene when the Veritas operative and the other gentlemen are walking out, it doesn't abruptly end. The U.S. Attorney's Office protested that the reason that they cut that off is because the, there was nothing on screen. Um, and so people think that maybe like the person who was wearing the button cam put on a jacket. So there was still audio, but there was no video. And in that audio, the person who was recording the video called Veritas and said, Yeah, I was talking with um, one of the organizers from IWW. Um, I don't think they know anything about like the upper echelon stuff. That led obviously to a whole bunch of um, uproar and more litigation. They withheld like 69 videos, but they also withheld the identity of the person who filmed the videos. A week before trial, my lawyer was actually able to interview them and all of a sudden they also became a star witness in my case. They actually undermined the narrative that Kirkhoff was putting out there uh, by saying like, I didn't believe anyone was planning violence that day. And that ultimately led to the chief judge finding a Brady violation. Brady v. Maryland was a Supreme Court case from the 1960s that basically said that prosecutors have the obligation and the duty to turn over any evidence that could that even has the possibility of being exculpatory, basically helping to demonstrate the innocence of the defendant um, to the defense in, as a part of discovery. And as a result of all of that, he dismissed certain charges with prejudice against certain defendants, barred the introduction of any Project Veritas videos, and any evidence of a conspiracy. He effectively wiped out the government's conspiracy um, case. And from that moment forward, the dominoes just started falling, and there were no more prosecutions after that. In a blow to the Trump administration's efforts to silence dissent, the first trial of people arrested at Inauguration Day Disrupt J20 protests ended Thursday. In December, six of those people were acquitted and the government dropped charges against 149 others. However, 59 protesters are still facing multiple felony charges. The group defending The government in a statement said that it would now, quote, focus its efforts on a smaller core group that we believe is most responsible for the destruction. Prosecutors have dropped felony charges against several people who face possible decades-long prison terms after they were arrested. Dozens of protesters arrested at President Trump's inauguration are now off the hook, and some of them could get paid. What? On July 6, 2018, the state quietly dropped its charges against the final 39 J-20 defendants bringing the drawn-out legal saga to a stunning conclusion. In the final tally, out of the 226 individuals eventually prosecuted for their participation in J-20 protests, 205 cases were dismissed, with 21 individuals taking plea deals, most under youth statutes that saw the bulk of their charges dropped. The state wasn't able to secure a single jury conviction. Throughout the course of these proceedings, J-20 defendants received an outpouring of solidarity, with comrades around the world taking part in coordinated days of action, dropping banners, throwing up graffiti, and dedicating militant direct actions to their cause. These comrades knew that the stakes of this case were high, which only made the victory so much sweeter. And to top things off, class action lawsuits have been filed against the Metro PD, which will almost certainly translate into a nice little payday for co-defendants, thanks to the cops' inability to follow their own rules. Additional proceedings have also begun against Kirkhoff herself, stemming from her botched attempts to secure decades-long prison sentences through a desperate campaign of lies and misinformation. I think one of the most important things we can do is to create a culture, a, a normative culture, in which we do not cooperate with police, we do not answer questions, we do not appear in federal grand juries, we do not accept plea bargains that incriminate others, we do not uh, consent to searches. And creating these as practices which are just the, the norm allows us to act collectively in a way that protects the most vulnerable. And it would have been good for the unpermitted march to have brought in the core of people 
who were part of the organic planning of it, so there could have been a more disciplined approach to how to respond as the police aggression intensified. There was a core of people who had been involved and then tons more people who hadn't been involved who just heard show up with a mask. And there wasn't a process of like engaging folks around like how to approach that all as strategically as possible. We may have missed a little bit of an opportunity to understand the bigger context of like what we were going into and what these things look like. Like when else in history did a dictator start doing certain things with the news, news media. What other times in history and how did cr the criminalization of dissent look like? Like, what is it, first of all? Like, do we all understand what repression is and what it's used for and how it's used and who uses it, who benefits from it? It's incredibly important for us to do political education. I think we've got to understand the things that we're saying and understand the things that we're seeing in a way that we can talk about, we can talk about like in everyday language. I think that it's it's important for folks to understand more and for folks to read more about how uh, the, uh, the state uses conspiracy law. And hopefully um, in the coming months, people who are involved in this case and other conspiracy cases over the last past couple years will keep writing about this and will keep um, helping us collectively to understand as a movement uh, against capitalism, against white supremacy, against nationalism. So a couple months after we were all arrested, I was at home and I get a frantic call from my coworker. So I go on Facebook and I see that my personal Facebook is being attacked. My address is being given out. They obviously know where I work. And it was clear that I was doxxed by the far right. The list of everyone arrested during the J20 was released. And I believe, and what most people believe, is that the cops actually provided this list to the far right. We fought the, the Fed subpoenaing our Facebook. Then they wound up actually getting uh, access to all of our data with names redacted except for our own names. That, so far, has not gone anywhere. And that's why you practice good security culture. <laughs> During the J20 prosecution, there was a lot of discussion about you know, points of unity and people um, agreeing to certain points of unity. And in a sense, I'd like us as a, as a movement to move beyond that, where when people are, are arrested, when people are in custody, they presume that already there's going to be mass defense, there's going to be collective defense, there's going to be non-cooperation with, with plea agreements, there's going to be non-cooperation with federal grand juries. If you have deep-rooted trust, you can navigate political and tactical and strategic disagreements without like never speaking to people again who used to work with really closely. The the major victory, apart from you know, 200 plus people having their lives back, um, is hopefully that there was a little bit of a roadblock put in place to what I saw as a really massive erosion to the ability to go out and and be an opposing voice. In terms of social precedent, in terms of you know the ways that people treat this case and, and might react to similar things in the future, uh, having this as uh, as one of the examples to sort of draw on, um, I think that was really important and a, and a big win for um, for the left and for for the grassroots. I think this is a true test case, and I think it's it's very clear that we rose above that and that people were able to act. Um, collectively in a time when the state was doing all it's could to kind of split us apart and pit, you know, so-called good protester against bad protester, against those of us who are, quote, just there, to those of us who are, quote, breaking things. Um, and so I think that that really is an example of, of solidarity in action and a real true strength of our collective abilities. J-20 may have been the first mass prosecution of political dissidents in the Trump era, but it hasn't been the last and you can bet that there's more to come. Since taking office, Trump has presided over sharp escalation in state repression, a trend that has coincided with a surge in paramilitary white nationalist and fascist violence. So far, migrants, refugees, and Muslims have borne the worst of this reactionary wave, but they are not the only groups in the crosshairs. As women and trans folk brace themselves for expected rollbacks of gender identity and reproductive rights emanating from the Supreme Court, new federal and state legislation has already been introduced to criminalize numerous different forms of political protest, with laws specifically targeting land defenders and anti-fascist protesters for enhanced sentencing. 
Meanwhile, the FBI has adapted its COINTEL Pro playbook for crushing black liberation struggles, this time under the guise of fighting so called black identity extremists. These continue to be dangerous times. And while we can and should celebrate the J20 victory, it's also important to not allow it to lull us into a false sense of security. So at this point, we'd like to remind you that trouble is intended to be watched in groups and to be used as a resource to promote discussion and collective organizing. Are you interested in starting a local legal support collective or just seeking to increase your crew's knowledge of how to navigate the court system? Consider getting together with some comrades, organizing a screening of this film, and discussing where to get started. Interested in running regular screenings of Trouble at your campus, info shop, community center, or even just at home with friends? Become a troublemaker. For 10 bucks a month, we'll hook you up with an advanced copy of the show and a screening kit featuring additional resources and some questions you can use to get a discussion going. If you can't afford to support us financially, no worries. You can stream and or download all our content for free off our website, sub.media slash trouble. If you've got any suggestions for show topics or just want to get in touch, drop us a line at trouble at sub.media. Just a heads up that we've decided to hold off on our fundraiser drive until the new year, but we're going to be stocking up on swag, so be sure and check out sub.media slash gear for all the submedia fans on your Christmas list. This episode would not have been possible without the generous support of Ropt and the excellent footage shot by Wes, Brandon, Ross Damani, and the good folks at Unicorn Riot. Stay tuned next month for trouble number 17 as we take a look at our society's current mental health crisis from an anti-capitalist, anti-colonial, and anti-state perspective. Never try to simplify or put etiquettes on people, you know, put labels on people. Uh, this person is traumatized, or this person is, uh, is gonna be okay, she's, uh, she's strong, she's resilient, right? We simplify situations that are very complex. Now get out there and make some trouble. The worst motel I ever seen. Cameras everywhere, but no TV. The staff was rude, I felt feathered and tarred. If they on young, they get zero stars Don't get me started on the shuttle service Zip tied heat blast swerving on purpose Sweat dripping makes back into my eyes I think the limo driver was a cop in disguise When well, life gives you baloney and pepper spray You put it in your tummy with no delay Cause at the motel, Nusha, enjoy your stay Might be the only thing you eat today